Hello and welcome to the April 11, 2018 Nutritionist Webinar. Um, you were just listening to a podcast by Laura Hernandez of the talk from last month so that we could have a good introduction mm -hmm. into some more transition cow talking. I'm Marianne Fesenden from AMPS and your English language host. This, um, this monthly webinar series is dedicated to providing technical talks from internationally recognized educators for listeners around the world. Paula Torillo from Cordoba, Argentina translates and hosts a Spanish language webinar. And we are joined by Tom Long from Hemingway in China, and he's hosting in Mandarin. There will be a question and answer period immediately following the presentation. Listeners can submit questions through me, Paula, or Tom. A complete recording of archived webinars as well as question and answer sessions for each will be available at the AMTS website. For those of you who would listen to the presentations while driving, we have converted videos into MP3 files that can be downloaded to your device for offline listening. This month, we're pleased to host Dr. Tom Overton, Professor of Dairy Management in the Department of Animal Science at Cornell University. Tom serves as the Director of ProDairy and is the Associate Director of Cornell Cooperative Extension. Like most production professors, Tom wears many hats in his position at Cornell. He teaches a dairy nutrition course for undergraduates, an upper level seminar course for dairy oriented undergraduate students, co teaches a course in dairy nutrition for veterinary students, and works with students in the Cornell Dairy Fellows Program. We are grateful he can take time for our webinar. He joins us as the second in the Transition Cow Mini Series that we're running this year. Thank you, Tom, for joining us. This is, a, this is special as you're in our office and we got pizza. Usually our presenters are pretty far away. We have a sold out crowd. To the audience, if you have questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat or the question and answer window. We'll answer them at the end of the presentation. I'm going to thank you, and Tom, you are good to, to begin. Thanks, Marianne, and, and uh, great to be here. And again, in the AMTS offices with Marianne and, and, and Lynn Gilbert as well. Um, and thanks, everybody, for joining today. It's, it's great to be part of this Transition Cow uh, webinar series that AMTS is hosting, and thank you to the sponsors uh, for that. To you today is we're going to talk about... Uh, liver metabolism in transition cows. And this actually takes me back, uh, honestly, through most of most of my career, starting in graduate school at the University of Illinois, working with Jim Drakeley there, and continuing on through uh, basically our program in different ways um, at Cornell. And so, uh, and again, I, I, I recognize we've got a crowd from around the world, so uh, good afternoon, good evening, good night, and good morning, wherever you are you know, right now. And obviously others will tune in uh, sometime later by by uh, by and watch the recorded webinar. So I want to first here start and, and just uh, talk about our transition goals and, and I'll let you read these. Um, but we certainly have high expectations for uh, transition the transition cow for transition cow management and for transition cow success. And we expect these cows to to uh, you know calve and and have high milk production. We want to have you know modest losses of body condition score. We want to see low instances of both metabolic disorders and immune-related disorders, um, and, and again, work on minimizing that, that loss of immunocompetence, or at least uh, manage that. Of course, we want cows are going to have uh, early days of first ovulation and good conception rates at first service. We want calves that are born alive and, and ready to thrive. And you know, again, our high-performing dairies and our consultants that work with those dairies, you know, achieve all of these by really focusing on continuously improving management in all areas of what they do, whether it relates to the nutrition program specifically, whether it relates to feeding management, whether it relates to facilities and grouping management, um, and all different aspects. And that's really what they what they do and how they achieve success. So, so I'm going to start here just like I, I tend to start uh, a number of different presentations here lately, and then we'll dive more into the topic at hand relative to deliver metabolism. But the transition cow, I, I, we've been, been preaching this message for the last number of years um, in terms of, of let's shift our focus or our mindset from viewing the transition cow primarily as a disease opportunity to the transition cow as a production and reproduction opportunity. And I... I put that out there because I, I think that at the farm level, we still largely focus on 
clinical disease issues, um, and we interpret the presence of those, of course, as a problem, which I would agree with. But I think sometimes we, we falsely interpret the lack of those as a lack of opportunity to better in the transition cow. And, and so we, we continue to kind of um, uh, preach this, and I'll show you kind of some of the data that, that, that gets me there anyway in terms of thinking about this. The, um, this, this slide has lots of uh, numbers on it. I apologize to our, our interpreters out there in different parts of the world already. Uh, the next one's got a bunch of numbers on it too, and then hopefully things will get easier from there. But one of the things we've, we've done the last several years is we've done a, a large transition cow management field study here in New York and Vermont. So most of the herds are in New York, and some are in Vermont. There were 72 herds total in the data set. And one of the things we did is, is we had full data on these herds in terms of their, their records. We had uh, all their dietary information. We characterized um, uh, their, their uh, the blood, blood parameters in both pre-calving and post-calving cows. Uh, we had facility and grouping characterization. We had lots and lots of information to work on. And this was really a project that Allison Lawton, uh, now Allison Kerwin, uh, did, has done as part of her PhD. But I'm just going to take you through pieces of, of this, and, and what I've done here in this slide is I've captured disease rates or clinical disease rates on these farms um, and other metrics relative to, to numbers or percentages or rates that we think are achievable. Okay, so I'll take you through the, the displaced abomasum here as the first example, and and you know I certainly think that herds can run consistently less than three percent DAs, um, DA rate in fresh cows. And of course, lots of dairies can run 1% or less, okay? In our data set, 77% of herds achieve that range. So the majority of herds were successful at doing that. We also had what I would call an alarm rate. Uh, Daryl Nyam and I came up with these um, uh, guidelines as part of a cattle health insurance program here in New York State. And we would say that 6% or over 6% would represent an alarm rate. In other words, you know, that's the level for sure at which we've got significant opportunity for improvement. Now, you may draw different lines here relative to alarm rates and things like that, uh, but the point here is that herds can have pretty darn good control of, of diseases like displaced albumasum. Similar, clinical milk fever, of course, you get into things like subclinical hypocalcemia like Laura Hernandez would have talked about, and those rates get much higher. But, you know, we also have a, a majority of farms anyway with very low clinical milk fever rates. Uh, we have about two-thirds of the farms with under 8% retained placenta. We get into ketosis, and here's where we start to see some opportunity. Now, we define this uh, based on our blood measurements, both clinical and subclinical beta-hydroxybutyrate concentrations in blood in cows between 3 and 14 days in milk. Uh, and we found that in this case, you know, 20 to 25% of the herds actually were above the alarm level, and only you know, 50 to 65% of the herds actually were within the achievable rate. So it tells us we've got some opportunity there to do better on things like uh, on things like ketosis. Mastitis, again, another opportunity area. We had a fair number of herds that were um, that were above the alarm level there. Uh, still more, it's not doing too badly here. Um, always an opportunity that, that is worth digging more into. And then about half of our herds in the data set were, were had dead and sold rates less than 60 days in milk. And I think for those of you who have looked at those numbers or track numbers like these on your herds, you know, I think as herds have improved their nutrition, improved their management, we've seen these numbers come down. So I think by and large, on a lot of dairies, we're doing a pretty darn good job of controlling clinical disorder rates out there. Now, it takes us though into, if we dig a little deeper and, and, and I pulled uh, three studies in here, again, this is this I will apologize to, our interpreters, uh, and it will, I promise it'll get easier from here. Um, I pulled three different studies here that, that were large epidemiological studies. Um, the Ospina study was led out of Cornell, our Linus group, and, and our group, and had 100 herds here in the Northeast in that data set. The Chapinel study here, that was led out of the University of Guelph, and involved 55 herds in the U.S. and Canada, across the U.S. and Canada. And uh, Huzzy was Julie Huzzy and her PhD work in our group, um, you know, and, and involved actually only two herds, but about 400 cows intensively sampled in that study. And the, the markers, what I've got here is, is these studies all characterize blood-based markers of energy status, like NEFAs or non-certified fatty acids, 
Uh, again, BHBAs or blood ketones. Uh, this Chapinel also did calcium, and uh, Julie Huzzy's work did haptoglobin, which is a marker of, of systemic inflammation in the cow. And it, what I want to draw your attention to is that is is in, and again the numbers and thresholds for our discussion here aren't important. Uh, the percentage of cows over these these thresholds or under in the case of calcium, you know, are, are not important um, uh, necessarily for our discussion. But I want to draw you to the associations. And I think in general, when you look down the, the slides here you see relatively small or modest associations with clinical disease rates at the herd level. Not to say that that's not important, not to say we can't find associations at the cow level, but at the herd level, you know, you're looking at, you know, I'll, I'll take you through this first one, Ospina, you know, herds that had more than 15% of their cows with pre-calving NEPAs over 0.3 had 3.6% more DAs or ketosis, but they lost one to two units of 21 day preg rate and they lost about 500 pounds of milk across all animals in the herd. Now, economically, it's the last two that really mean something that are, that are much more meaningful than the, than, the, than the increase here in DA or ketosis. Now, of course, those are probably interrelated, um, but if you run down the data set here, you know, the second metric on post calving NEPAs plus 1.7% DAs or ketosis. The point of preg rate, 640 pounds of milk in first lactation, 12, almost 1,300 pounds of milk in second lactation. You roll down here, and again, you can see, I won't go through them, but you can see very negative, very strong relationships with things that relate to production and reproduction and more modest effects on, uh, on, on disease. And we actually put a, a short article into Ford's Dairyman. Um, you know, on this in the last year, Dell Nightem and I uh, wrote that, and so you can probably find that online. All right, so let's get into some some stuff that's easier to chew on. And and you know, we think about focusing um, on managing metabolism of transition cows. We focus on managing calcium uh, status to prevent hypocalcemia. You know, we want to facilitate the cow's adaptations, in energy, and protein metabolism. We want to avoid that maladaptation or, or poor adaptation and negative energy balance. We want to support our immune function, avoid chronic inflammation, and we want to minimize management-related stressors and potential negative interactions with metabolism. And I'm really only going to focus on the second one here and maybe a little bit on the, on the immune inflammation as it relates to the liver. Uh, Laura Hernandez uh, is, is, again, a, a star in this area, and she um, certainly did an excellent job on talking about calcium with you uh, during the last webinar. Oops, so we're going to talk again about the second one here on facilitating your adaptations on energy and protein metabolism. All right. Again, for the, the technical difficulties. So those of you who are well familiar with the, the transition cow and, and regulation thereof, as Bauman and others have really articulated over time, you know, recognize that there's exquisite adaptations in this transition cow, both from an energy and protein metabolism standpoint. And we have... Um, in adipose tissue, of course, these cows were are set to mobilize uh, adipose tissue in support of, of lactation. Uh, the gut does grow um, as the cow consumes more feed, getting into lactation. Uh, the muscle changes its fuels um, and has some adaptations in protein synthesis and protein degradation. The mammary gland, that's what this is supposed to be, um, of course, has increased number of secretory cells, uses more nutrients, and has more blood supply. But the liver is really a, a key organ uh, in this whole process and, and intersects a variety of different things in part because it's absorbed things from the gut. You know, it's, it certainly is related, there's a relationship between what happens out of adipose tissue in the liver and of course the, you know, things like glucose are critical for uh, milk synthesis, et cetera. Okay? And of course we want these things to work in a coordinated way. So we really think about the liver as, as the crossroads of metabolism uh, in the tra in the transition cow. So, one of the things Chris Reynolds, who's who's very well known in in this area and in, in ruminant physiology in general, and he's in the UK now. And this is work that he did while he's in the UK. Is is just this concept that that the liver is highly metabolically active during the transition period. And these are data that I pulled from two different studies that that Chris uh, published anyway. Uh, in which they they had one group of cows where they actually um, where they actually uh, slaughtered them at different time points here relative to calving, 
and they were able to weigh different tissues, including the liver. Um, and then another set of cows in which in the same set of cows, they measured oxygen uptake, which would be a proxy for energy consumption by the liver. And what we see here is that liver size anyway doesn't appreciably change during the transition period. You could argue that perhaps here, you know, starting a few weeks after calving, that liver size is starting to grow. Uh, we got a no slide change. Yeah. Yeah. Then you got massive liver. So again, this, these data were from, from Reynolds um, and two published in two papers back in the early 2000s. Um, in which what they did is they looked at liver mass during the transition period in one set of cows, and then they looked at oxygen uptake as a proxy for energy consumption by the liver in a in a second set of cows, and they did that repeatedly in, the, in those cows at different time points relative to calving. And what they found here is that liver mass did not uh, increase, or it was about the same during the transition period, about nine kilos wet weight, um, and maybe started to increase here as the cow got into early lactation, but again, not an appreciable change in, in liver mass in that time frame. Oxygen uptake, though, essentially doubled when going from this pre-calving period to the post-calving period. So again, that en liver energy consumption went, went up dramatically in that time frame, and we can take a crude uh, you know, measure here and say, okay, how many moles of oxygen per kilo of wet weight of liver? And we see that that essentially doubles. So again, a, a doubling any way of, of metabolic activity of liver in this, in going from the dry period into lactation. All right, and of course, part of that uh, large increase in energy demand is really to support gluconeogenesis in the uh, in the transition cow. This slide here is, is from Chris's work also, uh, again, where they actually measured uh, uptake of propionate, uh, lactate, glycerol, and by difference amino acids um, relative to hepatic glucose production at different time points relative to calving. A couple of things you see in this slide is, is just this very large increase in liver glucose output, um, again, to support needs for lactose production and milk production in this post-calving cow. But then we also can look at the relative magnitude of importance of substrates here. And we see that propionate uh, from ruminal fermentation of carbohydrates, you know, continues to be the, the predominant or the most important glucogenic substrate during this, this transition period, and of course, early, going into early lactation. Uh, lactate is also an important source. Some of this is going to be coming, cycling back from, from muscle. Uh, glycerol, of course, you get some glycerol, you know, especially post-calving uh, from a breakdown of, or mobilization of adipose tissue. And so you do have some glycerol coming in. And then amino acids are also a source of uh, glucose synthesis here in the, in the post-calving period. Uh, this famous uh, slide or, or figure from Jim Drakeley kind of just gives an overall depiction of lipid metabolism um, in this cow. So not only is this liver heavily involved in glucose metabolism, but it's also involved in lipid metabolism as well. And of course, this, this cow will mobilize adipose tissue in the form of uh, non-esterified fatty acids or NEFA, which can be incorporated into milk fat, can be used uh, for muscle or by muscle for energy but also take it up a portion to their supply by the liver. And that's an interesting thing is, and we've looked across, and, and you look at Chris's data, across a variety of different NEPA, NEPA concentrations and look at uptake, and it's, you know, the liver takes up about 20% of the NEPA that it sees. And so once in the liver, NEPA can either be oxidized uh, for fuel, either in the mitochondria, partially to, to uh, ketone bodies or, or completely to CO2, uh, or in the peroxisomes, again, for energy as well. Or if not oxidized, of course, they're esterified into triglycerides and either exported out of the liver as very low density lipoproteins or VLDL or stored as triglyceride. And, you know, we want this liver, if this liver is working efficiently, um, it'll burn, burn these NEFA or burn fatty acids for fuel and they'll, it'll burn completely to CO2. We'll get very little ketone body synthesis we'll see export of triglycerides as VLDL, and we'll see very little triglyceride accumulation in that liver. Again, these are some older data from our group, uh, but just depicting this relationship between intake and NEFA during this transition period. Uh, you see uh, dry matter intake here as this cow approaches calving tails off. As that happens, NEFA concentrations start to increase. They spike here. Uh, shortly after calving and then decrease as intake increases in this early lactation cow. 
And, you know, we can also alter this uh, this dynamic through diet. Uh, so we know when we feed controlled energy diets or lower energy diets to cows during the dry period, we actually flatten out this intake curve a bit. Uh, we tend to see cows that eat more post-calving, and we tend to see lower NEFA spikes as well. In my senses, uh, Phil may show some of that to you here in the, in the next webinar that you guys have. Of course, the liver does, uh, you know, the concentrations of things like uh, triglycerides, so liver fat um, in the gray, do increase here during the transition period. We see this is data from our lab across multiple studies that Maris McCarthy uh, published. Anyway, we see an increase here in liver triglycerides, um, you know, uh, all the way, you know, certainly into day one, and then again some more to day 21 before likely going down from there. Of course, she's also depleting her glycogen uh, reserves as she's, again, uh, focused on mobilizing or providing that glucose uh, for, for use other, where, other ways in the body. So, of course, one of the things we've known for a long time, and a lot of this is associative, although I'll, I'll show you some more uh, data to kind of beef this up, is, you know, when we see more triglyceride content in the liver, we see impaired glucogenic capacity from propionate. So one of the major things we want that liver to do, it doesn't do as well. We see impaired uh, capacity of that liver to convert or detoxify ammonia to urea. So you, we have impaired ureogenic capacity. Uh, we have impaired capacity to clear endotoxin, and there are some relationships here as well with, with reproduction. So a variety of things, um, and these are associations, you know, seem to happen that, that again, we would, we would say are not good things out there. All right, so one of the things Maris did is, is we, we've done a fair amount of work in our lab over uh, the period of time where we actually take uh, liver slice or liver tissue by biopsy out of transition cows, fed different diets or treatments, uh, we can bring it into the laboratory and we can actually look at the biology of that tissue. Um, you know, again, still reflecting the characteristics of those cows, and we can look at fatty acid metabolism and we can look at glucose metabolism in those cows. One of the things here, these are just a, a correlation data set. You know, the mirrors again pulled together from very from several studies in our lab that basically, you know, said we looked at the correlation of liver triglyceride content at day plus one, so immediately post calving, and then various parameters either day plus one, day plus 21, or um, some other ranges here post calving. And of course, what we see here is that uh, negative correlation, so more triglyceride, less glycogen. Uh, more triglyceride, some relationship with with metabolism of fatty acids. See fairly negative uh, correlations between liver triglyceride and propionate concentration or propionate conversion to glucose at day one or day 21. Um, and interestingly, when we look at things like NEFA area under the curve or, or blood ketone area under the curve, and we've, we've, there are a couple of data sets that support this as well, we actually see stronger relationships with, with blood ketones than we do necessarily with NEFA and liver triglyceride. And that's interesting because you know, we typically think the cow mobilizes NEFA, the liver takes up NEFA, the, the cow's ability to metabolize NEFA is overwhelmed, and so she converts it to, to triglyceride. But actually, you know, the R value there is, is only 0.29 between NEFA area into the curve um, postpartum and liver triglyceride content. Intakes are strongly negative, uh, so you know, the lower intakes uh, you know, during this time frame associated with that, that uh, higher liver triglyceride content at, at day one. Uh, we can also look at conversion of propionate to glucose at day plus 21. And again, NEPA error to the curve, a, a negative association there with that BHBA. Again, stronger relationship here with, with blood ketones, uh, positive relationships of propionate conversion to glucose at day 21 and milk yield. And, you know, not as strong, and it actually was a trend, but also with dry matter intake. So, so the liver does reflect really kind of what's going on out here in these cows. Okay, so the dogma, though, that, we, that we, we've had for a long time in this transition cow is that, is that ruminants are prone to fat accumulation in liver. Uh, because of high mobilization of NEFA and the inability of liver to ad adequately metabolize them. Quote, unquote, a, a major factor contributing to the development of fatty liver in dairy cows is slow rate of triglyceride export as VLDL, and high NEFA, NEFA mobilization leads to high blood ketones. Okay. Well, interestingly, um, you know, a couple different things here. One is, is I took some data here also from Chris Reynolds in which he looked at NEFA uptake by the liver during the transition period. 
And again, you see the same days relative to calving that he had before. I actually calculated the star here means that this is a, an Overton calculation of NEFA uptake on day one based upon NEFA concentration in the blood and, the, and that relatively constant proportion of NEFA that are taken up by the liver. You know, the liver takes up, at least in this calculation, you know, almost 1,400 grams of NEFA per day. But if you look at typical uh, relationships of triglyceride percentages and um, and the liver weight, she probably only accumulates 200 grams maybe or, or thereabouts of that as fat. So the reality is, you know, we talk about this liver not being able to deal with NEFA. Um, I would argue the liver actually metabolizes NEFA quite, a, quite well but there still is a spillover that we that, that the liver can't quite deal with or maybe an excess or whatever. Okay, so I would say there's, I would argue that there's opportunity to modulate what goes on in that liver. The other thing that's interesting is most people think there's a very tight relationship between uh, blood nephas and blood ketones, and the reality is there's, there's not. This is, these again are data that uh, Maris pulled together working with uh, Jess McCart, uh, who's now a faculty member here in our vet school and, and our group where basically Maris looked at this uh, correlation anyway or, or between area under the curve for postpartum NEFAs and postpartum ketones. If those were very tightly linked, you'd see a, a pretty linear relationship here. In other words, as one goes up, so would the other. But I think what you see here is, is yeah, there's a relationship, but boy, it's not a very good one. And so uh, I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of play there between um, you know, what goes on in terms of NEFA mobilization and also fatty acid metabolism in the liver. So my contentions would be that high NEFA mobilization doesn't necessarily dictate that cows will have high rates of triglyceride accumulation. The ruminant liver actually metabolizes the majority of fatty acids that removes the bloodstream. And although certainly there's, there's no doubt that rates of VLDL export in ruminants are lower than those in non-ruminants, I do think that modul modest modulation of these pathways um, or fatty acid oxidation can translate into meaningful differences and outcomes relative to fat accumulation, probably blood ketones, and, and what's going on in the cow in general. Uh, one of the other data sets I want to bring to your to your attention, this is a small one, uh, but it was done in, in Brazil, an interesting study published here just, just fairly recently. And what they did here is they took the this liver functionality index that uh, that uh, Giuseppe Bertoni and, and Trevisi came up with in in 2013 based upon albumin as an acute phase protein, cholesterol as associated with, with lipoproteins, and bilirubin as associated with uh, liver enzymes, and created this this functionality index. And they categorized again a relatively small data set here of 37 cows either being low or high relative to the liver functionality index. Interestingly, cows with high liver functionality index had a much higher resumption of ovarian activity in the first seven weeks. So 86% of cows uh, with high uh, liver functionality had resumption of, of, of ovarian activity versus only 29% um, in, the, in the low liver functionality. And again, a little caution that this, this is a small data set, uh, but still, I think, interesting to show. But what they they looked here at uh, at concentrations of inflammatory markers in, in NEFAs and cows with low and high liver functionality, they see elevated concentrations of haptoglobin that would be an inflammatory response in these cows with with uh, with uh, a low liver functionality index. Uh, same thing relative to to things like uh, uh, peroxinase, which is another uh, acute phase protein or marker of inflammation that goes the other way. Same thing with albumin. Uh, higher NEFAs pre-calving in these in these animals with low liver functionality, and again, they also had some data on insulin and things like that, and actually lower insulin, which might be indicative too of, of less intake and and more NEFAs, et cetera. So, you know, these things kind of fit together and, and show some connections maybe between energy metabolism and inflammation. So the other thing, of course, we want to do is support immune function and avoid chronic inflammation. And again, I think these things are, are hard to separate. Um, of course, in terms of th thinking about immune function here in this transition cow, um, we have decreased sensitivity and responsiveness of the immune system. Uh, there are some interesting changes in terms of how leukocytes or, or immune cells operate here in this transition period as well. Again, not super important to go into more detail for what we're doing today. Okay. 
And as Barry Bradford has outlined very nicely, there's lots of different sources of potential inflammation in this transition cow. And, uh, you know, Barry's got on here, you know, things like oxidative stress. He's got on here things like leaky gut, which has been well characterized by Lance Baumgart's group. Um, you know, uterine infl or metritis, mastitis, heat stress, maybe social stress, catecholamines contributing. So a variety of different, uh, you know, sources of inflammation in this transition cow. Of course, we know that cows with uh, metritis uh, and varying degrees of metritis have higher, have more inflammation systemically. These are data that, that a number of you are, I'm sure, are familiar with from Julie Huzzy, part of her master's work at the University of British Columbia, where she showed as, as cows went from being healthy to mildly metritic to severely metritic, you see elevate, or increasing concentrations of blood haptoglobin in these cows. So again, I'm marking anyway, you know, that, that systemic inflammation in cows with, with increasing severity of uterine disease. Now work that she did in our program, you know, again showed that, that we can associate haptoglobin with, uh, with uh, negative milk yield. So, and this has been published now actually in 2015 in Preventive Vet Med. Uh, but again, cows that have more, cows in this data set that had more than 1.1 grams per liter of haptoglobin in, the, in their in their blood had uh, lower milk yields, uh, and again, they were sampled at different time points here, and showing some fairly large, you know, 1,600 to 2,600 to 5,000 to 700 to 2,500 uh, pounds less milk and lactation. Okay. Also of interest, though, in here was that there actually were a relatively small percentage of cows, both first calf heifers and older cows, over this uh, this level here prepartum. But you know, 40% of old of first calf heifers in this data set, and 27% of older cows had elevated half the globin concentration. So again, there are significant uh, proportion of animals with that out there. Of course, we also had uh, effects on rep or some associations anyway with reproduction. Again, high haptoglobin concentrations, uh, slower rates of reproduction. Actually, this was in uh, this was one way we did this data set. Again, when we finally published, it was about a 20% uh, decrease in, in conception by 150 days in milk. So one of the things that Barry has done, um, Barry Bradford at K State has done, is he's kind of brought out this concept of acute versus chronic inflammation in, uh, in, in, in the concept that, you know, the, at the end of the day, the inflammatory response isn't a bad thing, it's, it's essential, uh, but what we want to have happen is we want to, if that inflammatory response is needed to deal with a disease or a pathogen, we want that to, to, to essentially to fire, but then we want it to resolve quickly and that cow get on with her life relative to normal metabolic adaptation and, and normal estrus cycles. And it's when, we, when this inflammation, um, you know, occurs, but then doesn't really resolve very quickly is when we get into issues with negative energy balance, metabolic disease, and infertility. Okay, so the last thing we're going to do, and then we're going to talk about some practical ways we're going to, we're going to manage liver metabolism in these animals. We want to minimize these management-related stressors and potential interactions with metabolism. Okay, so now again, the, of course, stressors decrease intake in milk, uh, increase mobilization of uh, body fat and potential muscle wasting. Uh, they divert nutrients. There's lots of regulation here around cytokines and stress hormones that, that do this. Okay. The one thing I'm going to bring out, and a number of you have likely seen the work of Jeff Dahl, but there's others who've worked in this area as well, but heat stress in these transition cows is really a, a bad thing, not only for the cow, but also uh, relative to her calf. I'll show you some data from Jeff here as well uh, that he and, and one of his former grad, or graduate students summarized, who's now at University of Georgia, uh, but just showing the effects of prepartum cooling on milk production after calving. and, and you know, showing, you know, in all these nine studies here, showing uh, pretty meaningful milk yield responses post-calving to cooling during the during the dry period, okay? Now, I'm not going to get into all of Jeff's story. Uh, heat stress also has profound effects on the calf. But one of the things they published recently, and this is some of Amy Skibble's work working down with Jeff, is they looked at a variety of, of things related to the liver metabolism and pathways of, of molecular and cellular metabolism in this in this bovine liver, you know, in these cows that were heat stressed. And the things that really come out are, are the variety of things related to the, so we have some real alterations in things that relate to oxidative metabolism, to mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, 
to things that relate to, to various aspects of energy metabolism. So a variety of things that we would generally characterize as negative responses in that liver, you know, in that heat stress scenario. So it's not just, again, uh, things that relate to nutrition, et cetera, but also certainly management. So how are we going to do it, right? How are we going to improve liver metabolism in these cows? Well, we're going to control energy intake, okay? We're going to have cows of appropriate body condition score. We know that cows, uh, you know, who, who calve in fat are certainly more at risk. We're going to control inflammatory or stress responses in these cows. And, you know, I'm going to talk just briefly about, you know, adapting to postpartum diet and avoiding subacute rheumal acidosis. We've already talked about heat stress and potential impacts here on liver function. And then we can also think about nutrients or additives that we can use that, that will help to support optimum liver function in this transition cow. I'm going to kind of walk through these. So I'm going to I'm going to capture the the nutrition, the energy side real quick in terms of just some summary recommendations. And I think you know if you look at the body of literature um, out of Jim Drakeley's group and and other groups out there that have looked at energy status, including some of our own, um, Sabina Manns, and I'll show you some brief results from. You know we want to keep energies down far off, and you see some numbers here. You know, essentially, if we're using the model, we're looking at 110, 120 percent of energy requirements on, of course, the the AMTS and and the CNCPS work on an ME basis. Uh, but you see those numbers there. You know, and and really keeping starch levels low. We're not going to worry about macromineral balances uh, within reason anyway in far off cows. We don't worry about decads per se or things like that. And Laura talked about that, I'm sure, last last webinar. Close up, um, if we're feeding the same diet to heifers and older cows, I like to kind of a low to moderate energy approach, 110 to 130% of energy, 16 to 18% starch. Recognizing in, in, my, in our world here in the northeastern U.S., we're commonly transitioning these cows onto diets at, you know, 23 to 28% starch after calving. So I tend to like to have starch levels no more than 8 to 10 percentage units difference between prepartum and postpartum. And I recognize it's going to vary depending on where you are in the world. Um, we're going to supplement with, with, with uh, rumen undergradable proteins. So we're going to meet these metabolizable protein needs for Holsteins anyway in the 1,200 to 1,400 gram range. And of course, we're, we are going to worry about our macro minerals, our vitamins, and our trace elements. If we're doing one group of nutritional strategies, again, a lot of herds, that is the most practical option. I will say I, I think it's always a bit of a compromise, as I show at the bottom, uh, but, you know, in terms of two group systems, but I think on some farms it's, it's going to be the most practical option. We're going to be low to moderate energy as well, uh, maybe, you know, 14 to 16 percent starch. We're going to still put some more room and undergradable protein in the, in the diet, but we're probably not going to be quite as aggressive with it. And we're going to formulate minerals like the close-up ration, so regardless of DCAD strategy. And, you know, again, it's, it's going to be, you know, a bit of a compromise, I think, performance, health, and cost. But, you know, it's clearly some farms it is the most practical option. show you some, some work here. I'm actually going to uh, fast-forward one slide here just to pull the, pull the, the full data up. Some work that we did, uh, Sabina Mann, uh, who's now a faculty member at Cornell in the vet school, working with Daryl Nightham over there and, and me, you know, where she fed cows either a, a essentially controlled energy diet for the whole dry period, uh, an inter, kind of an intermediate step-up diet, so, uh, you know, especially during, during the, the close-up time, and then a high energy diet for the, for the entire dry period. And Sabina showed, just like lots of other studies have shown, that when we overfeed cows before calving, we have higher NEFAs, higher blood ketones, and most of these studies have also shown lower intakes post-calving. So we really do want to control energy levels uh, uh, before calving for good, good metabolic status. We get in trouble for too low energy. We get in trouble for too high. We also get in trouble if they sort the diet. Um, of course, ruminal acidosis, I think, can be a real deal in these transition cows as well. This is some work that Greg Penner uh, did a number a few years ago now. Uh, we and, and some folks at Minor Institute have also been involved in looking at some of these things, as have others. Uh, the, the treatments here aren't all that important because the treatment effects actually weren't all that significant. But what they did is they, is they categorized varying degrees of ruminal acidosis in these cows during the transition period and early lactation. And what they found here was that uh, was that when the, in these cows they looked at area under the curve for uh, for room of pH and again categorized these cows as either mild, moderate, or acutely uh, ruminally acidotic. They didn't see a whole lot of acute ruminal acidosis. Uh, didn't see a whole lot of moderate either. But you see here in days one to five after calving this huge spike 
in, in acidosis or subacute rheumal acidosis in these cows. And so I do think that we need to be mindful of the transition of these cows onto lactating diets and try to have good rumen adaptation either through the carbohydrate side or thinking about, you know, various ingredients, you know, yeast or yeast culture type additives or others that are going to help us facilitate ruminal um, adaptation during this time frame. Now, choline's been out there certainly for some time. Uh, choline's a quasi-vitamin. It's got a variety of, ac- of functions in metabolism. Uh, the one that we think about mostly relative to the transition cow is, is probably phosphatidylcholine. Uh, there's lots of potential interactions with other nutrients, although I will say that uh, choline clearly works differently than these other nutrients do, so I'm not sure about the substitution value with these other nutrients. Um, there's lots of cycling of choline anyway in, in one carb metabolism, and of course we have to feed choline in a, in a protected form. Again, choline works very specifically in the cow. I've got the, the Drakeley slide here again, or figure, and we see choline here export or facilitating export. It is again through phosphatidylcholine essential for assembly and and uh, and uh, export of VLDL. So it works very specifically in the cow, and as a result, will we'll generally decrease liver fat accumulation. Okay. Uh, we were one of the wor- first groups to really study this in the liver. This is back, uh, this is actually the first study we did at Cornell um, and published it in 2003, and basically showed lower uh, rates of accumulation of, of palmitate as, as fat in the liver as we fed more protected coal, as we fed more choline to these cows. Okay. We also saw uh, a tr- almost a trend, not quite, for, for lower liver triglyceride accumulation here. But there are other data sets out there um, that do support the, the, the concept that, that choline will decrease liver fat accumulation. One of those is here from uh, University, uh, is University of Wisconsin, Rick Rummer's group, in which they used their, uh, trigl- their feed restriction model and demonstrated very nicely that, uh, that, that cows uh, fed choline accumulate less triglycerides in their liver when, they, when, they're, when they're feed restricted. And likewise, they, uh, they uh, recover better um, after uh, feed is restored. So again, choline certainly has a role there in, in fat metabolism in the liver. And Rick Grummer also has published or put together some proceedings work, and it's related to some meta-analysis work that they did, you know, these various studies that show as choline is supplemented, um, generally seeing positive milk yield responses and, and pretty consistent overall. So um, again, suggesting that that uh, you know this improved liver function or metabolism translates into improved performance. So just to summarize choline for you, um, although the number of cows for treatment in, in lots of these studies is relatively limited, you know, pretty darn consistent milk responses across experiments. Um, they aren't always statistically significant, but you know, again, you look at the pattern. Um, the data don't support that choline is going to drop NEFAs. We wouldn't expect that, and actually choline is not directly anti-ketogenic. So you're not necessarily going to see it in BHBAs either, um, but, you, you know, but again, you are going to see it through uh, improved fat metabolism in the, in the liver. Again, in some cases, BHBAs may go down, but again, it's not going to be directly anti-ketogenic because there's other things that influence that. And you know, again, that mechanism of export of triglycerides from the liver is VLDL consistent with, with data from other species. All right, of course, uh, you know, a variety of nutrients here, choline, methionine, betaine, the folates involved in methyl metabolism. And again, I'd like to reinforce the point that, at least from my perspective, the data generally do not support um, that these things work in the same way. So there are res- uh, opportunities for both choline and I would say methionine in, in transition diets. Uh, there have been a variety of studies done looking at methionine or methionine plus lysine supplementation, either as, as protected forms or analogs here in transition cows. And again, just scanning here on the right-hand side, you know, not all the time, but generally showing positive responses here in terms of milk production or lactation. So amino acid supplementation beginning before calving, leading to better performance after calving. And I would say in general, not showing consistent effects on liver fat metabolism. So it's, it's operating in a little different way. Okay, I'm going to show you quickly so just some data here out of uh, Juan Lurie's group at University of Illinois. Here's uh, um, uh, uh, Johan Osorio is now at South Dakota State. Uh, several papers really focused on the outcomes from the same study. They had about 38 cows in the study, uh, applied treatments for 21 days pre-calving and 30 days post-calving. 
they had an unsupplemented uh, control or unsupplemented thionine control, um, uh, you know, from uh, with and this is NRC 2001 numbers at 1.8 percent of, of MP. Uh, the analog here of, of, of uh, isopropyl ester of HMBTA, um, you know, here at uh, these levels pre and post calving, uh, protective methionine at these levels pre and post calving, you know, et cetera. And they did have some lysine supplementation there in this study. So just summarizing their results, uh, cows fed methionine pre and post calving had, had higher uh, neutrophil phagocytosis, so better immune cell function at 21 days after calving. They had lower inflammation, as reflected by lower blood uh, seroplasmin and serum amyloid A. They had uh, greater oxygen at radical absorbance capacity, so positive effects on oxidative status in the liver, greater liver concentrations of glutathione, which is related there too, and carnitine, which is related to fatty acid oxidation, um, altered gene networks and, and uh, consistent with, with these responses, and then some epigenetic effects here through methylation of PPAR alpha, which is really one of the main uh, controllers of lipid metabolism in the liver. So a variety of things that, that, that again, suggest a role for methionine there as well. Rumensin, of course, rumensin is, is well known to many as well. Rumensin is an ionophore. Um, it alters ion transport, shifts energetics in the rumen. You get more propionate. Uh, pretty extensively studied as a feed additive and as, as, a, as a capsule. It's available or bolus. It's available in different parts of the world. There we go. Advance here. There we go. So meta-analysis from Todd Duffield, um, just showing uh, the effects of, of menensin on circulating blood ketones in transition cows. And you know, again, you see across a variety of studies here, uh, certainly showing reductions in blood ketones in cows fed uh, fed uh, rumensin uh, during this transition period or administered by bolus. Okay, we also showed Maris McCarthy in some of her PhD work. We fed rumensin to cows pre and post calving. We fed about 400 milligrams pre calving, 450 milligrams post calving, um, and did also see that reduction in blood ketones in cows fed rumensin. Okay, we also, um, we also studied uh, liver metabolism in these cows and did see um, anyway a, a trend anyway for increased uh, conversion of propionate to glucose. So saw better. Uh, you know, better conversion of appropriate to glucose in cows fed rumensin. Okay. We also increased that ratio of glucose to CO2, which we can interpret as uh, essentially better efficiency at which the liver was able to convert propionate to glucose by with rumensin. So just to summarize and conclude, um, you know, the liver represents the crossroads of metabolism in transition cows and is centrally involved both in energy metabolism and inflammatory response. Uh, excessive triglyceride accumulation, ketogenesis, and inflammation do affect both liver metabolism and outcomes related to production and reproduction. And then finally, um, these strategies to improve uh, liver metabolism certainly involve nutritional management, uh, management of body score, and minimizing stressors that uh, in impact overall regulation of metabolism. And I should say liver function. Sorry about that. I, I know you've had a lot of function today. Uh, with uh, with our technical issues, but uh, affect liver function. Okay, and again, thanks to AMTS for your patience and uh, and for you for attending today. Okay, I want to thank everybody for their patience. And as we sorted this out, there seem to be issues that continue, but hopefully we can handle all this. Um, before we get to the question and answer period, I want to thank thank Tom. For, for all that he put up with. And as we progress, if the audience has any questions, enter them in the chat window. I can see that now that I've grabbed back hold of my computer mouse and, um, or the question and answer tab and we'll get to them. Um, what we'll do if you're not familiar with the, the process is we will cycle through it. Paul will ask some questions. Tom Long will ask any questions that he has from the Chinese side. And then um, we'll ask the questions. We'll get to yours. Usually I don't miss any. And if I do, start screaming at me in the chat window. Um, it may be a night for screaming at me. Let's, um, I want you to make sure you join us next month for Phil Cardosa. He's going to wind up our transition cow discussion. 
He's an assistant professor of animal sciences at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where he conducts research and provides outreach programs in the area of dairy nutrition and reproduction. Dr. Codosa was born and raised in Brazil and soon discovered his passion dairy cows and got involved with livestock operations in the southern part of Brazil. His experience with dairy farms in Brazil and the U.S. brings a different perspective and management skills that help him with discussions in class. He obtained a Ph.D. degree in ruminant nutrition from the University of Illinois and a master's and DVM degrees from the College of Veterinary Medicine at Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul in Porto Algeri, Brazil. Phil will de deliver the final presentation focused on transition cow nutrition on May 9th. Mark your calendars and plan to join us next month. We're excited to announce that we're going to launch a Beef Nutritionist webinar. It's a new net webinar series based on this, the Nutritionist series, with a focus on beef cattle. We'll have abbreviated sessions this year of five presentations begin beginning on May 9th and following June 13th, August 9th, September 12th, and October 10th. We have most of our speakers and topics decided. Alejandro Relling from The Ohio State will talk about fetal pro programming. Alfredo De Constanzo from the University of Minnesota will talk about backgrounding. Danny Fox from Cornell University will talk about factors affecting predicted performance. And Jonas Sarturi from Texas Tech is joining us. Our beef webinars will be presented in English and Spanish with Paula Torillo co-hosting from Argentina. We're thankful for our series sponsors of the beef webinars of AB Vista, Rock River, and AMTS. We're holding the beef nutritionist the same day as the, as the nutritionist just earlier in the day, so Paula and I will be especially busy on those days. If you're interested, please email webinars at agmodelsystems.com. Um, I want to thank my co-hosts and all the people that made this possible today. Um, AMTS USA and Global. Someday, um, Marcelo Hens Ramos from Brazil will be joining us. He said he was going to join us in April, but I did not see him. Um, Paula Torillo from Argentina, and she thanks especially Rock River Laboratories for sponsoring her um, efforts in Argentina, and Tom Long from Hemingway in China. We are especially generous, or we are especially thankful for the generous support of these sponsors. Um, Ajinomoto Animal Nutrition North America, part of the Ajinomoto Animal Nutrition Group, and Arm & Hammer Animal Health, makers of cattle feed ingredients that optimize dairy health, are our gold sponsors. Our silver sponsors are Dairy Land Laboratories. Virtus, makers of Strata with EPA, DHA, Omega-3s, and Prequil with Omega-6s. Cumberland Valley Analytical Services, Kemen, featuring USA Lysine, Dairy One Forage Laboratory, R&D Life, Life Sciences, and AB Vista. Our bronze sponsors are Aminomax, Purdue Agribusiness, Jeffo, Quality Liquid Seeds, Adiseo, Origin H, Inc., and Novita. Um, the first one is going to be from Jim Jim Aldrich, and he says CPS or NRC calculating factorial factorial requirements for MP or CU uh, for close up cows. Close up cows, sorry, uh, will likely not ever add up to 1,400 grams, even if you factor in requirements for mammary development. So where does the 1,400 gram recommendation come from? I realize field observations suggest better transition performance when MP is high, and what intake are you assuming for the 1,200 to 1,400 grams? Should we look at the requirements as a concentration, for example, grams per kilogram of dry matter? Jim, is always uh, a great question and a detailed question from you, so uh, you don't disappoint today even. Um, so, you know, I think when you add in the mammogenesis requirement to NRC, um, it does get you toward that 1,100 gram range, uh, maybe arguing a little more than that for some margin. Um, you know, I, I, you know, Patrick French a few years ago, I think you're familiar with this data set, put together some more regression-based analysis. Um, 
and you know kind of kind of determine optimums a little bit higher uh, than that. So you know we have we've kind of adopted that. Although you know I would I will admit that the uh, the actual controlled research on uh, on transition cows and and feeding protein before calving is a bit of a mixed bag. Um, we that that intake is based generally on um, somewhere in the range of 14 kilos, so about 30 pounds of dry matter, you know, for those close-up animals. Um, we also have started looking at it as a as a gram per kilo basis. You could easily convert to grams per pound, but you know we would run our diets between 90 and 95 grams of MP per kilo of dry matter intake, and I think that that gets you gets you close. I mean, I'm not going to argue. You know, somebody needs to be at 1,400 versus 1,200 per se. You give kind of ranges there, um, and again, I think we could use some better, some more, some more MP work there. I do think something's going on, and, and there may be some interactions we're not picking up in terms of other aspects of metabolism. I have a question from Vahid. He says, NIFA and BHBA, should that be measured before calving or after calving? Yeah, so I think you know, um, NIFAs, NIFAs can be measured either time. Um, you know, our data and, and others, you know, would would show um, that higher NIFAs before calving are, are clearly associated with negative outcomes after calving. So, you know, if we're looking at uh, herds. You know, we want uh, if we're sampling herds across a, a window of two to 14 days before calving. You know, if we have more than 15% of those animals with uh, with NIFAs over 0.3 millimolar, we know we're at risk for more disease, poor milk production, poor repro. And you know, NIFA prepart of NIFA is a fairly fairly good predictor of of bad things to come in terms of you know high NIFAs during that pre-calving time, and it, it certainly comes back in part to lower intakes. Uh, post calving, uh, at least as a first step, we do have you know good herd side tools with uh, blood ketone meters, BHBA meters to look at uh, blood ketones, and I would tend to favor blood ketone testing only after calving. Um, I think that it's the rare case where we're going to see uh, blood ketones elevated in that pre-calving cow. So we're going to focus on blood ketones in the post-calving cow and you know three to 14 days in milk three to 15 days in milk is a sampling window you know again 12 to 15 cows 15 give or take um, you know cows sampled in that window as well and you know over you know more than 15 percent of our animals over 1.2 millimolar uh, BHB indicates a herd level opportunity NEPAs can be quite predictive as well, and they can give you a little better, a little different look sometimes because we have low ketones and high NEPAs like we talked about. Um, I tend to reserve them only in kind of herd diagnostic situations because they're, they're, we still have to send those off to a lab for analysis. We can't do them at the herd level. Um, they're expensive, and so you know we reserve those for, for those situations. But we also certainly associate, you know, if you've got more than 15% of your animals in that same post-calving window, with more than um, you know 0.7 millimolar NEFA, you know that's going to be that's going to be associated with uh, higher herd level disease, uh, poor milk production, poor repro. Okay, thanks, Paul. I'm going to try to unmute Paula and see if she can ask her question. Paula, go ahead and try. Okay. Hi, Tom. Thank you very much for your presentation. I I have a question from Pedro. Should we select dairy cows with larger livers to support the metabolic challenge? And another thing, if you had to choose the marker to know liver function, what would you choose? No, I'm sorry for that. So, um, you know, again, great question. Um, I'm not sure anybody's really, you know, thought about the, the genetics of liver size. Um, of course, you need to have an awful lot of uh, you know, liver, you'd have to kill a lot of cows to have a lot of, uh, uh, and have a lot of liver weight data to be able to do that. I also think the liver, liver, again, will respond to feed intake. So, you know, I think, it, I think there's some plasticity there in terms of liver size that I, I'm not sure is necessarily genetically related. Um, um, so I, I'm not sure that's a, um, that's an area that I think there's a lot of opportunity and people are interested in understanding the genetics or genomics of ketosis. And so, you know, are there, can we select cows um, 
that are going to be more able to metabolically adapt to, to negative energy balance and lactation, and, and there is interest in that. I think that has a, some merit or some possibilities. Um, in terms of markers of liver function, I think from an energy standpoint, uh, BHBAs are, are pretty good. Uh, you know, they're going to give us a good field level view. Um, I, I, again, I look at BHBAs as a marker that things are not things are not uh, things are not ad adapting uh, uh, just right there in the liver from that standpoint. In terms of, of other markers of, of liver function. You know, some people look at look at liver some of the liver enzymes. Um, I do think that um, in those cases, I mean, those certainly do reflect liver damage. Um, I don't think anybody, to my knowledge, people have not really looked at those in, in really, really large epidemiological data sets, and, and we have interest in doing that. Um, you know, of course, the liver also is involved in some of these inflammatory markers. We're very interested in haptoglobin as a, as a protein released by the liver in response to systemic inflammation. And so there, I think there are some other looks there, but it's, a, it's an area that, that certainly needs some more work. Uh, yes, it's a question from Emilio. Uh, he would like you to make some comments about the acceptable rate you showed us at the beginning um, of mastitis. Don't you think it's a high rate? Um, that's, is this mastitis, slide? yep. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so so just the way that we define yeah. this in... in um, in this data set was looking at just linear score over four. So this was not clinically defined mastitis necessarily at the farm level. It was simply defined based on, on linear score uh, somatic cell. Um, you know, and it would suggest that these are these are guidelines that, that again, our quality of production services group helped to put together, on the, specifically on the mastitis side. And, you know, I do wonder sometimes if we're too you know, are we too strict on this? And that's why we see that many cows or that many herds not not uh, um, not achieving this. Or, you know, do we really have some early postpartum mastitis that we need to do a better job of controlling? And it, you know, it certainly could be a combination of, of the two of those. So, so again, but a, a good question. Okay. Go back to a question that I have in the chat window from Aiden Kushnahan. Um, will he will he observe a positive response with choline? Oh, I, lost it. I saw it with over condition, with over condition or with body condition during the transition yeah. period. If the body condition is satisfactory, yeah. So it's a good logical question, um, you know. And and we know that cows that are over conditioned are more likely to lose condition and probably are more susceptible to fat accumulation. So you would argue maybe a better response in those cows. Um, I will say, coming back to the, the research, if you look at most of the studies, the, the cows in those studies are not over-conditioned. In a lot of those studies, they're, you know, three to three and a half during the dry period, body condition score, and so, yet they're still seeing responses relative to metabolism and in terms of milk production. So, um, so I think it's a fair comment that, that you, you may be even more likely to see positive responses to choline in over-conditioned herds or herds over-conditioned dry cows. Um, I think we actually underutilize choline in uh, in uh, um, in terms of, of the chance to see positive responses in herds that are are not over conditioned. Okay, I have a question from Kenneth Bosa, who's joining us from South Africa. So it's pretty late there. I think I think um, Aiden was also maybe joining us from some place where it's pretty late. Hi, Tom. Any comments regarding CLAs to decrease milk fat and therefore body weight loss during the first 21 days of lactation? Yeah, so for those of you uh, like Ken who actually stayed up, uh, or Kenneth who actually stayed up or up in the middle of the night watching this, uh, uh, find me next time you see me, I'll buy you a beer. Um, but uh, of course I will. Okay. Dr. Taluki has joined us now for, uh, for, beer. for something. So, um, you know, there's been some work done with with that thought that okay we can use CLA to drop milk fat in cows improve energy status. Uh, we've done uh, two studies there. Well, Bauman's or we did one study. Bauman's done another study going back ten years ago or more now. You know, and and we found that that you know during that key time, the first two or three weeks after calving, 
you know, that milk fat was pretty refractory to to CLA in terms of, of suppression. So we really didn't change energy balance um, in those cows. Um, and even beyond that, if we made, you know, we made lower milk fat, we actually made more milk. So yields of components didn't necessarily change. Um, you know, I, I've seen some of the data from overseas, um, and, and, you know, I think it's it probably still needs some look, but I, I'm not, I can't pull anything out of my head that, that says that we've got a real compelling opportunity here for CLA in the transition cow from an energy sparing or, or improving metabolic health standpoint. Okay. Okay. I have a question from Pedro. Would you suggest to use choline systematically? So by Paul, by systematically, what does he mean? He mean by routine. What's that? To every cow. What's that? Oh, you know, I, I think, you know, in my world, I'm used to thinking about we make we make nutritional decisions based on feeding a pen of cows. So, um, I mean, you could you could obviously, if you had the opportunity to to subgroup cows, you could. Um, I think I would tend to feed it across the board in part because I think you get, you know, if you were going to subdivide you'd, 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 or subgroup cows, you'd, you'd go to cows with higher body condition. But um, again, I think you, I think we're going to see responses across the group by it's just based on better liver metabolism in those cows. So I would tend to not, um, I would tend to, to do it kind of across the board or systematically, as you say. Um, Tom, any thoughts on the optimum temperature to decrease heat stress in transition cows? This is from Kenneth again. Yeah, Kenneth, you know, um, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to defer to Jeff Dahl's data on this. And I think that that basically you get over a THI of 68. Um, I don't know how to convert that, but a TH, what's that be 20? Tom says um, is when you'd really look to look to do that. So that, that's kind of where Bob Collier. I think it's drawn the line anyway relative to, to THI, and I think if you look at some of the doll, if you find some of the Jeff Doll papers, they'll they'll outline that pretty well. Jeff's got a variety of things, both of course published in things like Journal of Dairy Science, but also proceedings papers like the Western Dairy Management Conference, which are available online. You, know, you can just Google Jeff Doll and heat stress and and find some. And if nobody has any other questions, we're going to. Close it out. And just remember, there are archived webinars at our website, and you can listen to them in two ways. You can either listen to them online by clicking on the video itself, or you can listen to them by downloading them through the Vimeo website. And if you click on the Vimeo, you can actually download it, which is handy if you're getting ready to get on a plane and want to, if you want to learn while you're flying. And then we also have them as podcasts, which you lose the benefits of seeing the actual videos, the, the visuals, but it's a nice way to be able to learn something while you're driving. Paula says the people who were typing were actually saying goodbye. Hey, gang, thanks for taking time. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. And if I can find the controls, we will exit out of here.